Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen to 7.4 for calculus, finding the lengths of curves. All right, so what we're going to be doing is obviously using some integrals since that's kind of what we've been doing this whole time. And what we're going to be doing is actually calculating the length of a line. Straight lines are easy, so that's kind of out of the question. We don't need to do that today. But what we are going to do is we're going to first take a look at a sine curve. Just kind of thinking about it. We're not really going to do much about it other than just thinking about it. We know that the period of the function is 2 pi. And what that tells us is graphically the distance in the x coordinate is 2 pi. We know the amplitude of this function is 1, which means the distance in the y direction is 2. It goes 1 up and 1 down. But the question that we're actually going to try to answer today is how far did your pencil actually travel? So drawing this line again, how far is my pen traveling to go from the beginning of the curve to the end of the curve over one full period? Well, that's kind of a good question. Um, it's useful here and there, but it's kind of an interesting question. And we, what we can do is if we can break this problem into smaller parts. Well, let's think about breaking this into just this first half of the period. Now, this isn't circular, so we can't use anything about like arc lengths or anything like that. But what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in even closer. So let's say we zoomed in even closer. And now all we see is this part of the arc. But again, that's still an arc. And well, what, what happens if, if we try to zoom in even a little bit closer? The closer and closer you zoom in on this graph, the more linear your line looks. And you could do this on your graphing calculator. You just keep zooming in on a point. You zoom in on this point right here, and it starts to look very, very level, very, very flat. Now, what we are going to be doing is basically kind of adding a whole bunch of lengths of arcs. Well, hopefully that kind of sounds familiar. When we add a whole bunch of stuff together, that sounds like integrals. Because adding a whole bunch of stuff together is, is what we do for integrals. It's the Riemann sums, and that's just adding a whole bunch of areas of rectangles together. But what we're going to do is we're going to add up a whole bunch of little itty-bitty lengths. And what we can think about is as we zoom it in, as we zoom in on a single point, we're basically going to get a straight line. And since a straight line can be defined as a hypotenuse of a right triangle, there's a whole bunch of little hypotenuse or hypotenai, however you pluralize that word, hypotenuses, that we're going to be adding together, but we're going to need to know how long these different lengths are. Well, we know that this is the change in x, and we call that delta x. And this is the change in y, we call that delta y. And we're going to do a little bit of tricky math, because we know that the length of this length, the length of this length, the length of this hypotenuse is delta x squared plus delta y squared. Now, let's take a look at a little bit of the math behind this. We do have this square root of delta x squared plus delta y squared. Now that's just one of the lengths of one of the little itty bitty pieces. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding them all up. You remember this is sigma, this is summation notation. It's actually the Riemann sums of these little lengths. What we eventually want to be able to do is we want to be able to write this as an integral from A to B. But right now, it doesn't really look like it can be just yet because we don't have a delta x. We always need a delta x on the outside of our function. 
So let's think about this. If I was to say, I'm not going to write the sum of a whole bunch of times here, but you know in front of each of these integral, or in, a, in front of each of these square roots, there's got to be a summation. So we have delta x squared plus delta y squared. This is why we're going to do a little bit of tricky math. You probably wouldn't have th thought of this. But there is something that I can do to a problem and never change the problem. What I can do is I can multiply and divide by the same thing. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to trickily multiply and divide by delta x squared. And what this is going to end up doing, remember the summation goes in front, but I'm not going to do it there. Uh, let's rewrite this just a little bit. Oops, no D. And I'm going to put this delta x. Oops, sorry, I'm not multiplying by delta x squared. Erase that, goofball. I don't need the square. If I multiply by delta x over delta x, I can move this delta x to this side. And there is actually a way that I could put this underneath the radical. And that's by squaring and square rooting. So if I was to take this and I was to square this but also square root it at the same time, I haven't changed the problem. Now this is why this is a little bit tricky math because, again, it's not something you would have thought of. But I kind of want to show you the process of where this problem comes from. And now that they both have radicals, I can write it as one big radical. So delta x squared plus delta y squared over delta x squared, and I have a delta x on the outside. This is starting to look good because I have a delta out x out here on the right. But I don't have anything on the inside that really looks like anything familiar yet. So let's see if I can simplify this a little bit. When I have fractions and a single denominator, I can split that denominator up. Or I can split up the two fractions. All right, so now I have delta x squared over delta x squared. So let's rewrite this again. Remember the summation thing goes out here all the time. They're summing a whole bunch of things together. And delta x squared over delta x squared is 1. And then what I'm going to do here is since both of these things are squared, I'm going to factor that square out. And this should... This actually looks like we've got some stuff going on here now. Um, I could, I think I can now go straight to an integral. I don't know if you see it yet, but I can go straight to an integral saying this is actually integral from A to B, whatever the points that they give you, of the square root of 1 plus, okay, this, oh, D, or, this is delta Y over delta X, and we have a name for that. That's dy dx. That's the derivative of the function with respect to x. Well, we got to square it. And then delta x is just dx. And that's actually our formula that we're going to be using today. I have it on our next page typed out a little bit nicer. So if you have a smooth curve that begins at the point AC and ends at the point BD, then the length of the curve or the arc length of the curve is given or defined as these two statements. Notice that the top one is in the form of a, it's kind of an f of x equation or, or more commonly a y equals blah 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 with x's in them. Whereas the other one is take the derivative of x with respect to y, so this would be an x equals a blah 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 with a y in it for your variable. So on this, this version, the top version here, if y is a smooth curve on the function or of x on the interval from a to b, this is the x, right? x is on the interval from a to b. This, you notice that y is on the interval from c to d, and that kind of makes sense with the two points that we're given here. Now, every once in a while, and I do have one of each today, um, the second version actually is handier, and that usually comes with the derivative here. If the original derivative has a vertical tangent at certain points, um, you might have to change it to a function of y instead of a function of x.
you'll see what I mean here in just a moment. So what I want to do, I have two examples here. This is the first one. I have a uh, three halves power. And what we want to do is we want to find the exact length of the curve between x equals 0 to x equals 1. So we do want to use, we want to think about this first. We do need to know what is dy dx. What is the derivative of y or y prime here? So we take down the three halves. Um, the threes cancel because this becomes 3 over 2. Threes cancel. This becomes a 2. And I subtract 1 from the exponent. So this becomes 2 radical 2 times the x to the 1 half power. The derivative of negative 1 is 0. Now, the square root of x function, this x to the 1 half, doesn't have any vertical tangents on 0 to 1. So we're good with using this version. And I really hope you guys could all find that derivative. That's not a hard derivative to find. Now we can go ahead and find our integral. So we're going to go from 0 to 1 of the square root of 1 plus the derivative squared. So 2 root 2x to the 1 half squared dx. You do a little bit of simplifying. This one actually is pretty easily done by hand, as long as you can simplify squares and square roots and all that sort of stuff, and fractions. So I get the square root of 1 plus. All right, I square a 2, that becomes 4. I square a square root of 2, it becomes 2 times 4 is 8. I square x to the 1 half, I just get x dx. And if you used a little bit of u substitution, if it was necessary for you, you would get the antiderivative is 1 over 8 times the, uh, shoot, where am I at? 1 plus 8x to the 3 halves power. Oops, times the 2 thirds out here. Evaluated from 0 to 1. Now, I'm pretty sure you guys can find this antiderivative. If you can't, just come see me tomorrow. I will help you out, um, show all the little steps between. Um, 2 over 3 times 1 over 8 becomes 1 over 12. And then I need to evaluate when x is 1 and x is 0. So if I plug in a 1, I get 9 to the 3 halves minus, let's see, plug in a 0, I get 1 to the 3 halves. And do a little bit of simplifying here. I get 1 over 12 times, all right, square root of 9 is 3 to the third power is 27 minus not 1. 1 to any power is 1. 27 minus 1 is 26 over 12, 13 over 6 units. So it's a little bit more than 2 units long for this particular problem. That's kind of cool. That may not be cool to you, but it is cool to me. All right, the math really isn't hard, so really you got to pay attention that this new new formula for us on finding the length of curves is pretty interesting. So let's try the next one, and you probably know what's coming for this one. Oops, that was supposed to go away. Oh well, we have x to the, and I didn't even type it right, that's supposed to be a, y equals x to the one-third power for between the points negative 8, negative 2, and 8, 2. Man, look at me. All right, so we have to do the same process as we did before. And I'm going to look at dy dx. And dy dx is 1 third x to the negative 2 thirds. Well, the negative means this x is now in the denominator. And you'll notice that x equals 0 is in this, inter this uh, interval, which means this has a vertical tangent at x equals 0, and therefore it doesn't work with the x version. So we need to change it to y, and changing it to y is not hard. So I'm going to erase, and I'm going to try this again. This is actually a 1 third power because I didn't do it again. All right, so this is actually x equals y to the third power. And y to the third power is actually pretty straightforward. So 
I know that dx dy is 3x squared. There's no vertical tangents on this function. You do have to pay attention now that we're using the y version. So instead of going from negative 8 to 8, we're going from negative 2 to 2. So we're going to go ahead and do that. We're going to go from negative 2 to 2 of the square root of 1 minus, sorry, not 1 minus, 1 plus 3 Sorry, ah, goodness gracious, that's supposed to be a y. I can't apparently write today. 3y squared squared dy. And just to simplify this a little bit, we can say negative 2 to 2 of the square root of 1 minus, blah, stop please, minus 1 plus 9y to the fourth dy. Now this one might be a little bit more challenging to integrate, because um, I can't even think of what that integrates it to by hand. But what we can do is we can plug this into our calculator using math 9. This is one of our favorite things to do. Say so math 9, once you get that, you will get approximately 17.26. Now you have to be careful, and actually the textbook likes to uh, ask a couple of things. What if you were to do math 9 for this statement, going from negative 8 to 8 of x, oops, sorry, of the square root of 1 minus 1 plus 1 third x to the uh, negative 2 thirds squared dx. What would you get from that? And I think I tested on my calculator the other day and it says error, but you have to be careful. It it tries to do some sort of multiplication by zero and a division by, it's weird. But don't do it this way because this one doesn't work. This one shouldn't work mathematically for us. All right, so you need to be able to change things into the function of y and do your integrals with respect to y. All right, so let's see what is next here. What about cusps? You might recall that on a cusp, you remember graphs that come up here like this, there's no derivative. There's no derivative at that point. But what we can do is do a little bit of a split. We can actually split the function into two different integrals. So here is an example of what I mean by this. We have the function x squared minus 4 times the absolute value of x minus x. Now, if you were to graph this on your calculator, it actually looks kind of interesting. It will look something along the lines of this. Now, obviously, you'll have more of it, um, but Sorry, dang it. Darn thing anyway. I forgot to put our limitations. We are going from x equals 4. Or, goodness gracious. Right down to the last second. Can't even get it to right. So we're going from x is equal to negative 4 to x is Four. And you'll notice somewhere at zero is where that little cusp occurs. So what we want to do is we want to break it into parts. What happens when x is less than zero and what happens when x is greater than or equal to zero? Now when x is less than zero, it changes this function. When x is less than zero, that means x is negative. And I get y is equal to x squared now, if x is negative here, this just remains a minus 4x. And when x is negative here, this becomes a positive x or a plus x. So we would have plus x, which means my new function is actually y, not y squared, geez. y is equal to x squared minus 3x. And when we get y is equal to a, or when x is a positive number, I get x squared minus 4x 
minus an x. So I get actually x squared minus 5x. And for some reason, this gets me in the book says it's x squared plus 3x. I'll have to figure out why that is. I'm pretty sure it's a minus 3x. But then all we have to do is we actually just have to find integrals. Sorry, I didn't check that for myself before I started writing it. But we can do this. We can go from negative 4 to 0 and we can integrate the left side when x is less than 0. So we would integrate the x squared, not the x squared, we would actually integrate using the lengths of curves, if I was to pay attention to myself here. I was doing so good until the last, very last problem. So we would use our formula here, and then we would add it to the integral from 0 to 4 of my other formula. So we would do one equation in here, and we would do the other equation in here, because this is when x is greater than 0, and this is when x is less than 0. And a quick use of Math 9 will get you, as they say in the book, because now I have to check what they did compared to what I did, and it says it's 19.56. All right, so that will take care of the entire section for 7.4. Three basic examples. Just make sure you understand the formula here, going the integral from a to b of the square root of 1 plus dy dx squared dx, or the other version with the y's. All right, I will see you guys tomorrow.